two-man crew on this vehicle, so this ought to be quick. Now, there are two very immediate giveaways that this is not really a full combat capable tank. The first is in the simple forward folding hatch. There is ordinarily a port in the hatch, in the roof effectively of the tank, out of which you may throw your signal flags to signal to all your colleagues what it is that you want them to do. The other giveaway is the fact that there is no sight uh, in the front of the mantlet. Ordinarily, there's an optic right in the middle and a small little hole at which you may see. This vehicle obviously does not have one replicated here. And I say replicated because I'm not sure this is a real mantlet. Anyway, inside. Once you're inside, well, I have to say I'm relatively comfortable, although this is mainly because I have the hatch open. The seat is simple but functional, and the forward part of the seat will actually fold down out of the way to allow me to stand comfortably. Uh, I have zero observation out of this particular vehicle. I mean, well, okay, I guess I'm kind of lying a little bit. I mean, if I sit like this, I'm a perfect eyeball defilade with the bottom half of you know, my nose down, protected by the roof of the turret and from you know, my forehead up is protected by the hatch. Although I suspect this is unique to me and most soldiers of the time could not do this. Uh, other vision options are, well, supposedly you would have the TZF-2 sight directly to your front. This was obviously, of course, the main gun sight. Mounted centrally, it was an articulated sight, so no matter what way the gun was elevated, the sight would be level. Uh, reticle would go out to 800 meters. Uh, the other option for looking out would be you could simply open up the visor above the machine gun. Although why you would do this, because it seems to completely remove the point of having armor to the front of your vehicle in the first place, is beyond me. Another thing which is beyond me is why they put the vision slit equipped ports to the rear of the turret. I would have thought I would like the vision slit on the right or the left, you know, somewhere more likely that I'd be using, please. But Apparently not, I must be in a minority for the time. Now this is probably a partially refurbished turret. Main giveaway is going to be the mantlet and the mounting system for the two pieces of uh, MG-13. Uh, the machine guns are either MG-13 or MG-13K, the short version. They would have ordinarily a mounting system with an elevating hand wheel, and the traversing hand wheel is on the right. There are electrical triggers one on each control, so you could fire one of each of the two machine guns. Traverse. Well, this particular vehicle is equipped with a two-speed traverse. One is a simple, fine traverse, nice and simple. Uh, the other is if you shift it up a gear, you suddenly have course traverse, which should get you around much faster. The other option in the production vehicles is simply to disengage the gearing system entirely and just use sheer brute force to swing the turret around. You could also disengage the elevation on the machine guns, and thus you could fire, in theory, totally free-handed. The machine guns were mounted slightly differently on the production vehicles. The left machine gun was mounted directly to the mountain. There were no adjustments possible. The sight could be adjusted to match the left machine gun, and then the right mounting for the machine gun could be adjusted in elevation and azimuth to allow some sort of synchronization. Magazines. 61 25 round magazines would be carried for the machine guns. Eight of these magazines will be mounted on a ready rack just underneath the mountain, so exchanging will be very quick. Plus, of course, you have the two already in the guns. The majority of the rest were stowed in the right superstructure or on the hull wall behind me. Ammunition, well, in the Spanish Civil War, they went up against T26 tanks, and, well, they weren't doing so well. A special cord ammunition was developed, which allowed the Panzer I to destroy T-26s, the Soviet tank, at ranges of up to 150 meters. Unfortunately for the Panzer operators, the opposition soon figured this out, and they engaged from 200 meters or more with their 45 millimeter guns. The machine guns came with spent shell casing boxes on the right-hand side of each gun, and they had little quick-release uh, catches underneath. 
So the idea was that when your shell casing box seemed to be about full, you would take your bag or your bucket or your beret or whatever it was you're going to catch these casings in, place it underneath the shell casing box, use the quick release latch, it would dump in, close the casing box, and then fling the shell casings out your hatch or vision port or what have you. Further down by his feet, well, on the right-hand side wall would be the stowage for the various signal flags and forward of that two MG13 barrels. The propeller shaft actually isn't really in his way all that much, but an annoying feature can be found on the rear firewall. And those are the two intakes for the engine's air system. So the, I guess the thinking was that air that is inside the crew compartment is probably cleaner you know, less dust and dirt flying around, than air that is outside the tank. So it would suck in the air from the crew compartment into the engine. Fantastic, now, especially if it is a really hot day in the Ukraine in the summer, and you get this as an air conditioning effect as the air is dragged through your vehicle. Uh, there are problems, however, with this if it is a cold winter's day in Ukraine and this doubtless would have been quite miserable. Now, this is not a unique issue to this vehicle. You see this elsewhere as well. A number of American vehicles in World War II had a very similar concept of dragging the air through the crew compartment. Of course, they were bigger engines, so there was a lot more air. So you probably had a lot more complaints. I am somewhat limited by the fact that we appear to have a fake mountain in the front, so I don't have the obstructions that would ordinarily be here. But, um, you know, for the standards of the time, especially, bearing in mind, yes, you're a one-man turret and loader and gunner and all that, um, they could have done a lot worse. Anyway, next stop, driver. I don't know what it is about interwar vehicles, but drivers seem to keep getting short shrift. And this vehicle is no exception, although, in fairness, at least I can drive it. What confuses me though is the seat setting. This is an adjustable seat, forwards and backwards, and it is currently in the rearmost position. So whilst I can imagine that perhaps the typical person of the time would be reasonably comfortable as we are, how short would you want to be to get the seat to move forward? It looks like it'll go about yay far, judging by the adjustments. Once you're in though, the layout is actually pretty simple. It is your conventional three pedal arrangement. On the left hand side, of course, you have the clutch, which will depress simply enough. The brake is your middle pedal, and your accelerator is on the right. Steering, two nice large levers. Now I'm gonna have to look up to find out if this two handle arrangement is original or not. But your parking brake is basically, you pull it back and you press down with the plunger. And this will keep your uh, brake in place. Pull back, the plunger releases, push forward, and you can go ahead. The dash is quite simple, easily laid out. It's got a rev counter, speedometer, uh, oil pressure, and fuel. The speedometer, I note, has got about 52,000 kilometers on the clock, which is not bad for a tank of any sort, let alone one from 1935. And uh, it goes up to 100 kilometers an hour which is not bad for a tank of any sort, and I suspect highly unlikely for a tank of 1935. Transmission, it's a five-speed gearbox, manual transmission. Only gears two through five are synchronized. In fact, on later vehicles, only gears two through four were synchronized. I don't know why. If you look further forward, you're going to see a pretty good view of the steering and braking systems. So for example, I pulled the left handle back, you can see how the steering braking system works further forward. If you were to look further to the right behind the steering system, there's a false floor at the same level as that the commander stands on. Underneath it is the battery system, 12 volts for the General Electrics, and above it would be the transformer for the radio, the FU2. The radio would mount on a bracket hanging from the ceiling uh, of the superstructure roof. To raise and lower the radio mast, well, there's an internal handle here, which is quite simple. You pull down, radio mast goes up, you push forward, lock it in place, and the radio mast now goes into its little uh, protective uh, groove. To open and close the various different uh, viewports, well, 
for example, this lever system goes as far as the right hand side. There are two positions. This first position seems to just be a case of letting the light in, and then the second position opens it up all the way. An interesting feature is I note the starter motor is actually exposed. And if you look up the photographs of the original vehicle as it was built, you'll see there's even an emergency pull starter option on the rear firewall. Now this vehicle is a runner. They had it running for the first time last year uh, after about 20 odd years. And uh, they've decided that they're going to use a jerry can as uh, the fuel source instead of the original fuel tanks in the vehicle which means that it's also somewhat in the way of my getting out of the, uh, the escape port for the driver. But this is it, and out of it I shall now go. Vision outwards, well of course, it is the visor system. It's got visor to its front, big one, smaller one to the left, and then a couple of others scattered around we've uh, already mentioned. This is the full open position, so if I'm not in a threat environment, I'm driving along, I get the wind coming in my face, maybe wear my goggles, and I've got pretty good visibility. Now, if I want, for some reason, to stop the bugs coming in at me, or the large pieces of metal, this is sort of an open protected. There's still space around, a lot of light comes in, but I am now pretty much resorting to using the vision slits instead. And of course, in you know, proper combat, you close it all the way, it plugs into place and now purely is the, um, the visors. I do note that they have brow pads here as well. So when I put my head forwards, um, I'm not gonna bash my head too much. My, my little internal sensors have been kind of going off at me. So this little lever here, quite clever, this not only will lock the visor in place, but should bullet fragments come in and hit the glass or triplex or perspex or whatever it was that they were using at the time, if you rotate it further forward, this will allow the uh, block retainer to swing out of the way. You can exchange the vision block, put a new one back in that's nice and clear, close it, and away you go. Well, that brings us basically to the end of the tour of the tank. So now I have to get out. Now, this is actually somewhat easier to get out of than you might think, mainly because they were clever when they designed the seat. Witness. Oh, bugger, the tank is on fire. Panzer I gave the Germans their first taste domestically of modern tank operations. Indeed, the first Panzer Division exercises were held in 1935 here in Munster, mainly with Panzer Ones. Although a lot of the vehicles were simply ersatz vehicles because the production wasn't really up to speed yet. These vehicles could be anything from the unarmored one series chassis through regular trucks with fake cardboard bodies on the outside. 1175 1As were manufactured, 1935 and 1936. 15 were sold to China. These were both gun tanks and Befelswagens, the command vehicles. Add to that another 399 1Bs. 50 of each were sent to fight in Spain in the Civil War, and they were proved very reliable, some vehicles coming with up to 8,000 kilometers on the clock. However, significant shortcomings were identified. Now, even the Panzer Division exercise of the 35 did show that the tank probably needed an armor-defeating weapon, but this was just driven in when Soviet-built tanks were plinking these things at ranges of almost a kilometer with no possibility of a reply. Still, that didn't mean that they were necessarily combat ineffective. In the invasion of Poland, uh, the Mark I was a very significant contributor to the power, and also in the invasion of France. However, they started being replaced by bigger and better tanks over time, such as the 38T or the Panzer III. By the time Barbarossa started, there were still 300 on strength. By 1942, a program to convert the Panzer I chassis into other sorts of vehicles was in full swing. Two other types of Panzer I gun tanks were created. The 1C, the VK6.01, and the VK18.01, the 1F. The first was an exercise in speed, the second was an exercise in armor. 
neither of which saw significant service, the production of both being only a couple of score. Well, that brings us to an end of the tour of the Panzer I. As you can imagine, we're going to be on a bit of a German kick for the next while. So let's see what else the Panzer Museum has to offer. I'll see you next time. Greetings! Just a reminder, if you are not yet a player of World of Tanks, the free game, because it's not going to cost you anything to try it out, have a look at the text description below the video here. Download it, try it out, let us know if you like it. That was it, see you on the next one. Ow. Something else, something, something, something. Now the other option... Come on. Great, I've broken it. Hang on.